Before we get to the prophecy update today, I need to follow up on a number of requests that we've had to download last week's PDF file. I'm doing this chiefly for the benefit of our online church. Uh, last week we did a typology of the pre-tribulation rapture in ancient Jewish bridal customs. And uh, I made the mistake of saying, you can go to our website. Well, appreciate your patience. We didn't get it up as quickly as I would have liked to. It is there now. And I just want to quickly show you what to do. You go to calvarychapelkaneohe.com and select prophecy updates. And when you do, it will take you to this page. And the first one that's listed is the May 7th prophecy update. And to the far right, you'll find under the additional file column, a green arrow next to notes. And if you select that, you'll be able to download the PDF file. By the way, all the uh, files are there for all of the updates. They're also there for the Thursday night uh, study through the Bible and the Old Testament. And they're also there for the Second Corinthians um, as well. So you can download those PDF files. Uh, now, today's will be, uh, we're hoping by uh, tomorrow, it'll be available for a download. All right, let's get to our prophecy update. Today, I want to talk about how the pieces of the prophecy puzzle are being put in place at breakneck speed. This last week, I was kind of musing, pondering, thinking about how much has happened and how fast it's happened since we started doing these prophecy updates back in 2007, I think it was. It's been uh, going on 11 years now. For those who are students of Bible prophecy, I'm certain that you as well have witnessed the fast-moving prophetic developments for many years, some of you even for decades. We don't know the day or the hour of the Lord's return, but what's becoming abundantly clear is that we do know we are so very close. So much so that we find ourselves readying and steadying ourselves as the bride of Christ, waiting for our bridegroom to take us away as a thief in the night. But there are those who, and I'm seeing this more, and I gotta say it, it, it kinda breaks my heart because many have become weary and discouraged in their longing for and even aching for the Lord's return. Listen to what the Apostle Paul said in his second epistle to Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. He says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up, finally, keyword, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And listen, not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. You know what that means? That for those of us who long for the Lord's return, there is awaiting us at the Bema seat of Christ. This is the judgment seat of Christ. Not the great white throne judgment. The, the, the metaphor here, the comparison here, is to the ancient Olympic games. That's what Paul is referring to. And you have a panel of judges. And those judges are there not to judge you to damnation, but to judge you as to how good you did, how you finished the race. And then they crown you with that wreath on your head or that gold medal around your neck. Friday night, I hope you don't mind me sharing this, but I'm a pretty proud dad. Um, my daughter won uh, first place in the elementary division for vocalists, solo vocalists. And this is at Brown Bags to Stardom. Those of you uh, who know Brown Bags to Stardom has been around for a very long time, right? So she won first place. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it gets better. There were this panel of judges, and I was sitting right behind them. <laughs> and they, they, that 
those were the judges that judged her and rewarded her. And she not only won first place in the solo vocalist in the elementary division, but she won the grand prize. <laughs> yes, grand prize. Okay, I, I feel better. It, it, that's a healthy pride, isn't it? That's not a... But it just reminded me of what Paul was saying to Timothy here. That there's going to be this, this these panel of judges on that great and final day. And we too are going to be rewarded. Who's going to be rewarded? There's a specific crown, a specific reward for those who long for his return. That's encouraging. That's encouraging. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, you can understand why I want to hurry up and get to 1 Thessalonians. He offers this encouragement to the church in Thessalonica. He says, brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him, speaking of death. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep in death. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds. By the way, that, that, those two words, caught up, in the original language of the Greek New Testament, it's harpazo, and that comes from the Latin Vulgate rapturus, where we get the transliteration of the word rapture. So the next time... Somebody said, the word rapture isn't in the Bible. Just tell them, well, it's, I have a Latin Bible. It's right here. Rap, rapture, right here, rapturous. So anyway, do it in love. <laughs> Don't be militant. Uh, Going to be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. And then he says this in verse 18. And by the way, this is an argument for a proof text, if you, if you will, for the pre-tribulation rapture. He says, therefore, encourage one another with these words. If the rapture didn't happen before the seven-year tribulation, that would be uh, really cruel. Encur encourage one another with these words. You're going to go through tribulation. The bride of, the bride of Christ is going to get beat up, bus up. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. No. I share that to say this. If you're discouraged in your longing for the Lord's return, be encouraged. Our redemption draws ever so nigh in this, the last hour of human history. Don't lose heart. Don't be weary in well-doing, Galatians 6, 9. For in due season you will reap if you faint not. Don't lose heart. Let not your heart be troubled. Jesus said, in my Father's house are many dwelling places. And as we talked about last week, that's a bridal chamber. And if it were not so, I would not have told you that I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am, there you may be also. Don't let your heart be troubled. Don't lose heart. Take heart. The sufferings of this world are not to be compared with the glory that awaits us, as Paul says in Romans 8, 18. Do we get discouraged? Yes. I love what Oswald Chambers says. He says, God never faults a man for despair. There are times when our discouragement can give way to despair, but our longing for him to return is soon to be fulfilled. Proverbs 13, 12, one of those contrasting proverbs says, Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. I truly believe that our longing for the Lord to return is soon to be fulfilled 
as that tree of eternal life. And so what follows is the main reason that I can stand before you today and say to you that you can be encouraged by this. I believe this and I myself am encouraged by this and here's the reason. There's numerous reasons, but there is one chief reason that I see and it's the source of great encouragement for me personally. And it's that of the geopolitical climate today being ideal for the so-called two-state solution with Jews and Palestinians living together side by side in peace and security. And I'm hoping you'll hear me out as I explain why this one reason is the source of so much encouragement for me personally concerning the soon return of Jesus Christ. I'm going to begin with this Jerusalem Post article. As I share some excerpts from it, I want you to listen for this new tone. Listen for the, the tone, as it were. Starting with the headline, by the way. Abbas has decided to sign peace deal with Israel. Oh, that's new. Here's some of what the article had to say. Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas has crossed the Rubicon and voiced, quote, unprecedented readiness to reach a peace deal with Israel. Sources close to the efforts to renew talks between the Israel and the Palestinians have told the Jerusalem Post. Since his meeting with Trump last week, Abbas has changed his rhetoric, interesting, issuing a number of statements meant to reflect flexibility on previous demands. He has, for example, said that he would renew the talks under Trump's auspices without preconditions. In the past, he had said he would not negotiate with Netanyahu without a freeze to settlement construction. That's new. He has also sent his advisors to the press to declare that the Palestinians are prepared to negotiate land swaps with Israel, a recognition that some, this is stunning, some West Bank settlements will remain part of Israel in the framework of a future deal. Well, that was on Friday. The day before, on Thursday, the Times of Israel published this most interesting report about Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas after a meeting with Russian President Vladimir Putin saying that solving the Israeli-Palestinian conflict will be, quote, impossible without the participation of Moscow in the peace process. Wow. It is impossible to solve the Palestinian issue without Russia's meaningful participation in the peace process. That is what we have been emphasizing at all international meetings, Abbas said in his meeting with Putin. Putin said Russia will continue to give its full support to the resumption of direct dialogue between Palestinians and Israelis. The peaceful, interesting word, coexistence, of the two states, Palestine and Israel, is an indispensable condition to ensure genuine, and here it is, security and stability in this region, Putin said. Abbas, according to a report in the official PA news site Wafa, also reiterated that he is still willing to participate in a three-way summit with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu in Moscow. We are ready to accept this invitation at any time, Abbas said. Oh, okay. Well, now the question is, what's Netanyahu's response to all of this now that once again, the onus has been put on him? Well, we need look no further than to this Ynet News report in which they state that Netanyahu is wary of Trump's interest in solving Israeli-Palestinian conflict, saying that Netanyahu is concerned about President Trump's growing interest in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and his desire to, listen, reach the, quote, ultimate peace deal 
at any cost. What? I thought Netanyahu and Trump were just really good together. You saw his welcome and reception when he came to Washington and to the White House. You saw the red carpet rolled out for him, the agreement between the two. So now all of a sudden Netanyahu's wary of Trump's renewed interest in said peace deal at any cost? Senior Israeli officials have said that during Trump's visit to Israel, the president will, by, by the way, that's the end of this month, will announce the start of negotiations between Israel and the Palestinians. Trump insists on delivering his keynote speech in Israel during a visit to Masada. For those of you who have been to Israel with us, you know the significance of that particular site, Masada, in front of hundreds of guests. He is also expected to visit the Western Wall, along with his daughter Ivanka and his son-in-law, Jared Kushner. What I find really interesting about this is that according to the Post, 17 Arab and Muslim rulers affiliated with the Sunni camp received invitations Wednesday from Saudi King Salman to participate in a series of summit conferences to be held in Riyadh on June 21st, next month, during Trump's visit to the country. You know that the President of the United States is going to Israel, he's going to Saudi Arabia, he's going all over, he's going to the Vatican, he's going all over, and there's, there's a reason that he's doing this, and it's gonna be very interesting to watch how this all plays out. The first conference will be a meeting between Trump and the Saudi king, after which an Islamic Arab American summit will convene, followed by the last event which will bring Trump together with the rulers of the Persian Gulf oil kingdoms. Officials in Riyadh are reiterating that the stance that Trump's visit to Saudi Arabia is, quote, a historic event which we must make the most of. Oh, really? Uh, what does Iran have to say about this? Oh, I'm so glad you asked because <laughs> the article goes on to say that Iran responded to the perceived front against it, claiming that the lame Saudi regime proves once again that it is undermining the agreement between Iran and Washington. Remember that one? That nuclear agreement? Oh, yeah. And is acting on behalf of the Zionists to establish a front against Iran and present it on a golden platter to President Trump. Wow. Sounds a little bit like Ezekiel 38 to me, particularly verse 13, which mentions by the ancient name Sheba and Dedan, Saudi Arabia, as protesting this Russian Iranian led alliance of nations that attack Israel. It's important to remember that Saudi Arabia are uh, the House of Saud, Beit Saud, the Saudis, are uh, Sunni Muslims. And in Iran, they are Shiite Muslims. And here again is, well, that's a whole nother. Why did I open up that can? I don't have time to. Okay. I want to share two more articles before we tie the prophetic significance of all of this together. And I do so because it's going to be germane to our understanding of the prophecy puzzle. Now, you're already seeing this headline, uh, and I know that's uh, very disturbing, <laughs> but uh, it's from Fox News concerning the potential for an electromagnetic pulse attack devastating the state of Hawaii. Ironically enough, it was on the day I was born, July 9th, 1962, that Hawaii was hit by a massive electromagnetic pulse, also known as an EMP attack, which within minutes took down the state's communication systems and traffic lights and virtually everything that ran on electricity. Um, I came into the world with quite a bang, <laughs> you might say. Of course, it wasn't Hawaii, it was Beirut, Lebanon, but anyway. The EMP wasn't an attack by a foreign government 
Rather, the U.S. government had set off a 1.4 megaton nuclear warhead at a height of 248 miles <coughs> pardon me, above Johnston Atoll in an operation the military named Starfish Prime. The article goes on to say that with North Korea developing its nuclear pardon me, and intercontinental ballistic missile capabilities, Hawaii defense experts are concerned that they could target the 50th state with an EMP attack. According to Toby Claremont, deputy administrator for the Hawaii Emergency Management Agency, listen to this, quote, this is not theoretical, it has already happened. It's already happened. Now, this brings us to the second article from the Times of Israel about what's being dubbed as the largest cyber attack in history with over 70 countries hit. I, I think you've probably heard about this. According to the Times, a huge extortion cyber attack hit dozens of nations Friday holding computer data for ransom at hospitals, telecommunication firms, and other companies. The attack appeared to exploit a vulnerability purportedly identified for use by the U.S. National Security Agency and later leaked into the, leaked to the internet. Okay, appreciate your patience with me. I, I, f I feel kind of rushed, uh, but uh, for the remainder of our time, I want to revisit an updated prophecy puzzle uh, that I put together several years ago. I'm hoping to uh, sort of tie this all together and uh, make some sense out of everything that's happening uh, in the world today. I do want to uh, preface it by saying that uh, I in no way want to present this as having it all figured out. This is just one plausible scenario, and by plausible scenario, I mean that it is just one possibility as to how and even when all of this will play out and come to pass. In the interest of time, I'm going to have to proceed with the presupposition that you are aware of these prophecies and you know what they entail. If not, I would really urge you and encourage you to be a Berean and search these scriptures. If you're watching online, you can take a screenshot of these uh, uh, scriptures and then look them up. First, I believe we are on the cusp of the sudden destruction that Paul said would take place while they are saying peace and security in 1 Thessalonians 5.3. This is why the next puzzle piece is that of the prophecy in Isaiah 17 concerning the destruction of Damascus, Syria. Sudden destruction of Damascus, Syria. Along with Isaiah 17, I'm placing the Zechariah 12 prophecy puzzle piece by virtue of how the whole world today is obsessed and intoxicated with moving the boundary stones, the burdensome stones of Jerusalem. In addition to Zechariah 12, I'm also putting the Ezekiel 38 prophecy puzzle piece in place because of the Russian-Iranian-led alliance of nations that are today at the ready to attack Israel. And again, I keep referring to verse 13 in Ezekiel 38 because that's where Tarshish and the young lions thereof, along with Saudi Arabia, merely protest this allied attack led by Russia and Iran. And when I say all the nations stand at the ready, I'm also including those nations, chiefly Saudi Arabia, who is also positioned and postured perfectly and prophetically, even now, as we speak. Now, the reason I put Daniel 9.27 and Revelation 13 next is because I believe the Antichrist will commence the seven-year tribulation, and with it, the one world government, the one world economy, and the one world religion. See, not only is the world right now, today, as we speak, geopolitically postured perfectly, prophetically, but so too does that relate to the arena of technology, 
the technology exists today to implant a microchip in the forehand. Some believe it could be a tattoo or stamp on the forehand or forehead, without which no one will be able to buy or sell. In other words, something's going to happen on a global scale to bring the world together economically. A cyber attack would certainly explain that. So would an EMP attack. It would have to be a system that would be put in place, and the technology exists today, by which the Antichrist can control the world and a one-world economy. And so, too, will he control a one-world government, this new world order that we've heard so much about in recent years. And uh, perhaps more importantly, a one world religion, because this will be the mark of the beast. And once somebody, contrary to what a uh, well-known Bible teacher stated, once anyone takes that mark, receives that mark, they are doomed for all eternity. Period. End of story. And there are going to be people that will refuse to take it, and it will cost them their lives. They will be beheaded during the seven-year tribulation. We affectionately refer to them as the tribulation saints. Those who come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, they reject the mark of the Antichrist. See, that mark of the Antichrist seals them, just like Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit seals us for the day of redemption. And that explains why they are called and referred to as tribulation saints. I need to keep moving here. I'm going to bring it to a close with the question that I believe is before every one of us today. And this is where I'm really wanting to go with this. Here's the question. Conspicuously absent from this prophecy puzzle is any mention of the rapture, right? Did you notice that? <laughs> So the question is, where does the rapture fit into this scenario? I would submit, and again, this is a plausible scenario. I am not dogmatic about it. But I would submit that it's very possible that the rapture could happen in concert with the sudden destruction in 1 Thessalonians 5.3 that comes upon them while they are saying two words peace and security. And it will come upon them as a woman travailing in labor. That's an interesting analogy because Jesus uses that analogy and when Paul uses that analogy, it's always in the context of the Lord's return, like birth pains. A woman travailing in labor. Now, if it is, because Paul delineates in 1 Thessalonians between the they and the we. They, it will come upon them, but we who are alive and remain will be caught up. They and we. In other words, it's very plausible that this could be at the same time. And it does fit. It does fit. Because sudden destruction, not just maybe by way of a cyber attack, by way of a you know, nuclear attack. But think about this. Uh, how suddenly will the world be destroyed when the church is removed? Some believe that it will gut out this nation, rendering her inconsequential eschatologically, explaining her absence from the pages of Bible prophecy, and that fits. That makes sense to me. Now, if it is, and I'm becoming increasingly convinced that it is, then truly it would stand a reason that we need to look up, as Jesus said in Luke 21, 28, because our redemption draws nigh. And that really encourages me. That really encourages me. Because you know what that means? This, and I've shared this before, and I'm going to share it again. <laughs> 
I'm going to keep sharing it until I'm not here to share it anymore. And you better not be here to sh have, have someone share it either. <laughs> this is what gets me up in the morning. This is what gets me through the day. This is what enables me to fall asleep at night when I put my head on my pillow. It's that blessed hope, that blessed assurance, knowing that my Jesus is coming soon and my redemption draws nigh. And all the suffering in this world is not to be compared with that glory that awaits us when that trumpet sounds. And that's why I'm encouraged, is because we're seeing all of these things begin to come to pass. If you'll just bear with me a, a little bit longer, um, I want to uh, try to bring it in for a landing. <laughs> Sorry. Everything I've shared today, by the way, only applies to those who are born again of the Spirit of God. If you have never called upon the name of the Lord to be saved, I would be dishonest with you if I said to you that you can have this hope, that you can be encouraged, because this only applies. The redemption drawing nigh only applies to those who are born again of the Spirit of God. This is why I want to provide an opportunity for those who are not to call upon the name of the Lord, but before we do that, I want to briefly share with you an email I received last week about the ABCs of salvation. Dear Pastor JD, I watch your prophecy updates faithfully every Sunday evening in Latonia, Kentucky. I was compelled to email you about the ABCs of salvation. I'm in recovery and I sponsor women in recovery. We're the hub of heroin trafficking in northern Kentucky and the Cincinnati area. Our jails are full of addicts and traffickers. We go in and are part of a team that shares the gospel. However, it's frustrating to hear how some have complicated the message of salvation. They don't have much time in jail and the inmates are bored and inattentive. I didn't want a theological treatise when I hit bottom. I just wanted to know if I was beyond redemption. And if not, what could I do? I was telling them how simple the message is and showed them your update with the ABCs of salvation. Talk about inspire. I'm an artist. I'm making up cards with your ABCs, including the blocks and scripture. They're going to have them printed so they can give them to the women. That will be something concrete, simple with the message of salvation. I'm simply thrilled to have a tool to reach addicts. We have to keep it simple because most aren't able to function in early recovery. And, and this is interesting. An alcohol and addict's brain doesn't start functioning like a normal brain until 18 months after their last drink or drug. Quite a few find reading difficult and most don't make it. I share that because I have come under some pretty harsh criticism for making it seemingly too simple by presenting what's known as the ABCs of salvation. And by the way, I didn't come up with this. The only thing I did was I, I made the graphic and I put the uh, acronym and the, uh, what the ABC is and what it represents. And I did it basically uh, uh, based on what's known as the Romans Road that we're, we're all sinners, we've all fallen short of God's perfect stand of right. None, none is righteous, no, not one, save one, Jesus Christ. And that's the A. Admit that you're a sinner. Acknowledge that you're a sinner, that you've fallen short of the glory of God, that all have sinned. We were all born sinners, which is why we have to be born again spiritually. That's the A. The B is for believe. Paul writing to the Romans says, if you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ was crucified and rose from the dead, and then you see, call upon the name of the Lord, you will be saved. Confessing with your mouth, calling upon the name of the Lord, Romans 10, 13. 
Now, people have been wanting to add letters like R. That doesn't work. A, B, C, R, that does not work. What's the R for? Repent. I want to address it again this week. I think it's necessary that I do so. When I came to Christ, the repentance came at the time that I acknowledged that I'm a sinner. That's what the word repentance means. It's a change. It's a 180. I did a 180 when I acknowledged that I'm a sinner and I need the Savior. That is repentance. It comes in that way at that time. And as I've shared before, and I'm almost done, and I, again, appreciate your patience, but I just went into uh, the room. I was uh, living in a place with roommates, and I was so drunk, and I was so high, and I basically passed out praying. And my brain was so messed up from all the drugs and the lifestyle, and the I'm not proud of it. That's why this email really moved me because I needed it to be simple for me. My prayer when I prayed, it wasn't fancy. I didn't repeat after anybody. I just heard the gospel presented very simply and I responded. I repented. And you know what my prayer was, basically? I don't want to go to hell. I'm on the highway to hell. Like ACDC says, I don't want to be on the highway to hell. Jesus, I want to go to heaven. I don't want to go to hell. And I just remember something I learned as a kid. I, I want to drink from the fountain of everlasting life. And I fell asleep that, that way. I woke up the next day. I was a new creation, man. I was a new creation. I... It was, it happened. <laughs> I mean, I couldn't start my day without drugs and drink and tobacco and everything else. And I went to reach for those things. And the Holy Spirit now indwelling me spoke to me and said, you don't need that anymore. And I didn't. And I sold all my ACDC albums. I should have burned them. <laughs> I needed the money. <laughs> I think God's forgiven me for that. And I never looked back, and that was over 35 years ago. I got a hold of a good news Bible. That was the, basically, that was even a stretch because of the brain damage. Because I just really, you know, messed up my brain. And, you know, the good news Bible was a very simple Bible, and I read it all the way through, from Genesis to Revelation, read the Bible through for the first time. And... Uh, It was so simple, and it had to be simple for me. Otherwise, I don't know that I'd be standing before you today were it not simple. And so I just ask you today, if you've never called upon the name of the Lord, it is so childlike simple. And I would implore you to do so, so that you too can have that blessed hope that we have, knowing that our redemption draws nigh. Why don't you stand and we'll pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the patience of your people. Thank you for their listening ear and their open hearts. Lord, I do pray that if there's anybody here in this amazing church that is my privilege to pastor or watching somewhere online that has never called upon you, has never turned to you, has never put their trust in you that today they would do so. That they would call upon you and like Romans 10, 13 says, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Thank you, Lord. And Lord, Maranatha, come quickly. In Jesus' name, amen.